All right, good afternoon. Uh, it's good to see everyone. Oh, I have my clicker here. We're gonna talk today a little bit about uh, yet another drone, this being the sail drone, and this being uh, Lake Michigan. We'll talk a lot about Lake Michigan, but I will have other lakes in here, so you can either avert your eyes but actually the importance here is to, to be able to compare uh, across basins, right? So the opportunity to look at other basins and reinforce uh, what our findings are. So uh, before I get started, let me just thank you because there's a number of partners both in this room and, and also uh, around the lakes that have contributed mightily to this work. I'm just presenting on the materials herein, but keep in mind there's a whole team of members that have worked on this over the course now of a couple years. Okay, so the, the assumption here uh, for many of our surveys, of course, is that when we go out and actually collect fish, we do a good job of collecting the fish and that the fish do not avoid us, right? So this is a great example of fish avoiding other fish in this case, but we could imagine the same kind of scenario in which fish would avoid research vessels. Uh, and that is not just a theoretical concept, that might actually occur, uh, and that's a concern then because in those cases we could either bias fish low or we could, we could be selecting for certain groups of fish that don't respond in the same ways. And the way that we do prey fish surveys is often with, and this is not universally true, but it, it occurs in many of the lakes, we do it with things like uh, acoustics. And acoustics, we provide some sort of sound uh, energy that goes down into the water. It bounces off things underneath it. Here you see it bouncing off a bottom layer. And then it returns to the vessel. And we use that information. We can get all sorts of information about potentially the target underneath. And then using that target information, we can also compare it. We can, we can scale that into, let's say, fish biomass. That is with the assumption, again, that we are not dealing with avoidance. In acoustic surveys, um, that may not always be the case. So what I'm showing you up here is looking at more acoustic data. I know we've already looked at it. And this is from marine systems. And what you can see is, is pretty clear. You have, um, in this case, a, a layer of fish. And then there's a vessel that's overtaking an acoustic device. The fish respond to the vessel, both before it arrives and then while it's there. They remain actually at depth for some time, and then after the vessel passes, they return, uh, in, in some cases, back to the, the starting layer. And if this is occurring in acoustic surveys in the Great Lakes, right, so then what we're actually measuring is, is somewhere down here where we're potentially either misclassifying fish because we say, well, these are actually deeper fish, so they probably belong to this group, or we're underestimating biomass or the average size of these animals. This is really important to get a handle on actually do we see this in the, in the Great Lakes themselves when we go out and do the acoustic surveys? And historically, this has been hard to do because when you have a vessel and it's out there and it's doing surveys, how do you measure bias off the vessel? Uh, well, you could use another vessel, but that brings in the question of, are, are these, is the other vessel biased? Well, one of the things, of course, that we've been talking about this afternoon that we have access to now is lots of drones. And one of the assumptions that we can make with drones, which doesn't seem too unreasonable, is drones are really quiet. They probably don't create much of a disturbance. They're relatively small. Um, and so the fish probably really mostly ignore them or entirely ignore them when they're out there. And we use this drone, which is a sail drone. These are surface drones. They can create or collect a, a suite of data. And then we assume that they're unbiased relative to the standard that's out there. And I want to be clear that when I say small, I do mean small. But these are not tiny, right? These are, these are still vessels in their own right. They're multiple meters long. Uh, they're a couple meters high and they are noticeable in the water. So these are not like, uh, uh, say, just a, a little floating balloon out there that you might not even see. And sail drones also come with a bunch of other stuff that, that we can potentially use. And this is not, a, not, not to, to tell you that sail drone is the answer. This is just a, a drone that we happen to be using. But we collect lots of other data with them. So it's lots, you can compare a, lot, a suite of different things when you go out and do these kind of surveys. We've actually had these drones out on multiple lakes. Like I said, uh, there we, we're talking, of course, we're talking Lake Michigan, but we have other lakes to look at. Uh, but these red circles here are where we've done overtakes with different research vessels at this point. And you can see we've, we've really done a good job here. We've been all over Lake Michigan. This is across all the years that we've done surveys. We've done some work up in Superior now. We've been into Huron. Um, and last year we got into Erie as well. And then I'm going to kind of give you the punchline right away because that's at some point, people start to fall asleep when I'm lecturing, so I try to keep them awake. But uh, what you can see here, again, more acoustic data. And I know this is from Lake Erie, but it's a really nice, clear picture, so I wanted to use it because there's lots of cool things that you can see in this. 
He has an Eerie Explorer, here's a Sail Drone. But what we usually see is we see some layers of fish, right? It's always easy to find fish in Lake Erie. Uh, and then you see actually when the vessels get so close to each other, actually that the two acoustic devices are actually picking each other up. So that's what you see these lines coming in. So the Sail Drone, and in this case, the Erie Explorer is so close and we see this in all of our vessels when they approach a sail drone and, and vice versa, when the sail drone is approached by a vessel, they get so close in fact that we, we actually pick up the other transceiver, uh, the, the transducer that's, that's sending out energy. And we can also look at the fish. And maybe the giveaway right now before we go any further is we do not see fish layers suddenly changing location. So if avoidance occurs, we can, we can look at this more systematically now. We can actually kind of go down into the data, but we do not see the really strong responses that some marine studies have seen where fish layers dive and really get out of town. Uh, we do not see that broadly, so that, that should be reassuring. What we decided to look at then was a couple different measures, right? We're collecting a lot of data. We decided to look at this thing called NASC or SA, but really what it is is the amount of energy returning to our transducer, and that's related then to how much biomass is under these vessels. So one of the metrics we want to know is, does the biomass that we are sort of measuring under the vessel change as vessels approach? We also wanted to look at how strong the targets were. So how big a target under the, the drone or the vessel was there? It, did it change? So do vessels when they approach a drone, do we suddenly see targets getting smaller? And that would suggest that targets are actually pointing down or, or moving away um, from that. And then the other metric we decided to look at was target depth. So presumably if fish are moving, then we should see changes in target depth, pre presumably away from the vessel itself. Okay, so uh, one of the first places we did work is in Michigan, and we did this, uh, I have Huron on here as well, and we'll use some of that data, but we did a lot of work in Michigan. We did overtakes where the sail drone would be sailing in a path, and then we'd have the uh, motorized vessel come up and try to overtake it along the same path. In 2021, we were learning a lot about how the sail drone actually operated, so we were learning about what tacking means and what it means to be on a research vessel trying to follow a tiny little drone at night. We've done a much better job now, really doing a good job of getting these nice straight tracks. That's, that's partially my fault. You have to get good at predicting where the wind is going to be across the night and aligning it so that that crews can actually get on top of these vessels. And, and that isn't as trivial as it sounds. Uh, it, it, it's a lot like driving a boat, but you actually don't control it in some ways. So that's what they look like, right? So this little white track that you maybe can't see, and that's a good thing, is the motorized vessel. You can see here's the red track is the drone. The vessel has to spin around a lot, of course, because the vessel is going much, much faster. These drones are moving on the order of about a knot. And then they overtake the drone covering the same track of water. And so we're measuring all of the same acoustic measures in that track of water. And we also know what those acoustic measures look like right at the point of overtake. And then the vessels have to go busy themselves, um, sort of spinning their wheels and waiting for the, the sail drone to make more track in the water. And my apologies to the vessel crews if they're here because it, it is boring. Uh, but I appreciate all the hard work you're doing on that. So in 2021, what we looked at, we, we said, okay, let's just compare and see the difference between these. If we're right hovering at this zero line, these are different metrics, then we should expect to see no difference, right? So that's a no difference line. If we see any deviance from that line, then we're seeing um, differences between the, the drone and the vessels. Here we have a couple different vessels on, on this uh, comparison. That's what the colors are. In general, what we saw is really tight correspondence here. If the vessel measures something and the drone measured something in a, in a body of water, they both measured basically the same thing. There was, uh, there was, there was some evidence um, that there may have been differences at time. We interpreted that to be uh, just a, a related to stochasticity. Uh, and I would say that it, it, the point I will make now is that that's related to the sturgeon, the RV sturgeon. And we, will, we looked again at that vessel in 2023, which I'll show you a little bit of. And, and I actually think we probably have some evidence now that the sturgeon does have a, a little bit of difference from what the drone that is measuring in that water body. If we just look at the sail drones metrics, so we say, okay, I'm not interested in how, what the comparisons are in the transect. I just want to see that dip. I want to see a change in the value as you get closer to the vessel. What you can really see is it's basically a flat line, right? Like the fish, whatever metric you settle on, the fish really don't seem to respond very much to vessels. Uh, and we, we expected to see a change maybe as the vessel got closer, maybe within 500 or so meters. So this is in kilometers, so it would be right around here. We'd see some change and we really didn't see that. 
Our work from uh, Lake Superiors is pointing to if it does occur, it probably occurs almost immediately under the vessel, which from the perspective of are we doing good jobs of surveys is actually really encouraging. That means we almost don't care, right? If the fish leave after you pass over them, who cares? You already measured them and you've moved on. That may be a concern as you do things like trawling afterwards, uh, but for acoustic surveys, we may not care as much. Okay, and these are again different metrics. I included them all here just to convince you that these are all relatively flat lines, but it doesn't really matter what we look at, right? These don't look like there's a lot of curvature and we don't see really strong dips as the vessel approaches. I'm gonna go through this one really quickly. We did the same kind of thing in Lake Superior. Uh, we looked for differences. In this case, actually in Lake Superior, we did see a little bit of difference between the drone and the vessel. I know you can see that that is just off center of that zero line. And that translated to about a 10 to 15% difference in uh, number of fish per hectare estimated, which is not an insignificant amount, but it's also uh, was not different between vessels, which is reassuring. So we saw that vessels are probably comparable. So another question you might have is, fine, we maybe don't see a lot of difference, but do you have a lot of difference in vessels? And in, in 2022, it looks like, at least for the Superior Fleet, that was, that was not true. So we might anticipate that being true elsewhere in the lakes. And I zoomed in just to show you that those are not sitting right on top of the line, right? There is a slight propensity to be away from that line uh, with the drone seeing slightly more. Okay, so in 2023, we returned. We did some work in, uh, in Lake Michigan. Unfortunately, we couldn't do the sturgeon in Lake Michigan. I would love to show you that, but we did not get a chance to do overtakes. So we did, over, we did overtakes with the sturgeon again, but I, I'm sort of cheating here. It is in Lake uh, Huron. We're assuming that probably that the fish response is the same between Lake Huron and Lake Michigan fishes. This is brand new and preliminary, but I did want to show it to you because I think it is important. For the Smith, um, which was again done in Lake Michigan, what we saw is a lot of variability, which was not terribly surprising. Where we were serving, there were nights where there were lots, presumably lots of alewife. Sometimes those happen to be under the vessel, sometimes those happen to be under the sail drone, and we just get a, sort of stochastically driven whether one sees more or the other. So it's not a bias in any direction. We tend to just see that they, they saw variable amounts of fish underneath them. So at least for the Smith, we didn't have very much evidence or we can't detect very much difference between the drone and the, uh, and the vessel itself. So that's encouraging. Smith seems to, to suggest there's no bias. But actually what's interesting is, I know I haven't zoomed in here, but you can see that the sturgeon is again off center from these lines. And so we need to go back now and compare the 2021 data uh, and include it in here as well. But it seems that the sturgeon may be in the order of the more Lake Superior-like fleet, in the order of that 5 to 15% difference, and that the sturgeon may, yes, indeed have a slight uh, bias when it goes out and does acoustic surveys. So what does that mean uh, overall? I, I kind of gave it to you there. Uh, we have, we have um, a some avoidance in Lake Superior. If we have it in Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, it might just be related to that one vessel. It tends to be relatively low in marine systems. You're talking about as high as 50 or 100% difference. Here we're talking on the order of, of close to our detection limits, that 5 to 15% range. And we don't show a lot of response far away from the vessels. If it does occur, it's immediately and acute underneath the vessel, and it might literally be the fish twitching. So the fish is aware the vessel is right over top of it. And as the vessel is sitting right on top of the, the, the fish, the fish twitches to sort of begin moving, and then you're past it. And at that point, I don't know what happens, but that doesn't matter to me because you've already done the acoustic survey. All right, so with that, I think we've wrapped up. So I'll take any questions if there are any from the, from the committee or the audience.